Let's have a look at persistent storage with the memcache framework. So we'd be remiss if we didn't mention that there is a nifty means of manipulating our values across persistent cycles of service rotations up, in, out, and so on of service. In other words, across your service restarts, patches, updates, so on and so forth, you're bound to lose some cache data. And as a consequence, persistence becomes the order of the day. So persistence with memcache, and in particular DB as opposed to D. So this is an application of memcache in conjunction with the most widely used file base key value store, Berkeley DB. So it features persistence across service outages of your, of course, key value pairs. And as we've mentioned, it uses Berkeley DB. So if you're familiar with Berkeley DB, then essentially what we have is a stack of memcache D, which sits on top of Berkeley DB. So in essence, what is provided by this stack called Berkeley DB or memcache DB, with, which uses Berkeley DB and memcache D, is not a cache, but rather a fast means of accessing key value pairs that is certain to persist across service outages. So this amounts to memcache DB, which gives us an advantage over the existing memcache D. In addition, keep in mind that if you use memcache DB that no expirations are supported. So you may use your existing code to upload values into memcache DB, which may contain ex expiration times associated with them, but they will not be honored. Because again, the idea is persistence, which means of course you'll need to use functions such as replace, set, add, and so on to make changes. Because Berkeley DB is transactional, the combination of memcache D and Berkeley DB result in a transactional memcache DB. So transactional support, which means you get the typical acid that's known in the DBMS world, which means your transactions or your records are safe, which means you shouldn't lose any data in spite of, say, power outages, unbeknownst or unanticipated. So it is transactional, and in addition, it supports for those distributed applications out there replication. So you can configure Berkeley DB to push your values across n number of servers, let's say web servers, DBMS servers, middleware servers, or servers dedicated to memcache functionality. In fact, you can combine the functionalities of memcache D and memcache DB on similar systems because they use different ports. Let's just know that. So it binds to TCP 21201 as opposed to TCP 11211 for memcache D. So that means they can coexist. So both may coexist. And the default, so let's just note, default memory allocation mimics memcache D. So essentially what you have is an environment that replicates the setup of memcache D with the add-on of the DB under the hood. Also, let's note that it's, for the most part, compatible with the memcache protocol. Not all commands are supported, but most of the common ones, i.e., for example, sets, gets, replace, add, and so on. Just consult the documentation, but these are the key ones to make changes to your data store. And in addition, this is an environment that's largely zero administration based because of the persistent DB store of Berkeley DB with the front end of memcache. Now we should note as the documentation points out that this is not a cache, so not a cache, but a fast key value pair store. So it'll be faster for frequently accessed data from your website or your web applications or front-end applications than, say, hits to the DBMS. So more efficient 
than DBMS access for commonly used key value pairs. And again, the benchmarks speak for themselves. So consult the Memcache DB website. Have a look at the benchmarks. Have a look at the buzz online. Just Google Memcache, Memcache D, Memcache DB. And you'll see that for key value pairs, there's very few out there, or there, there's very little out there that compares in terms of reads and writes across typical key value pairs that you may need to drive your applications. So let's set out some tasks arbitrarily. Let's say we load some data into the existing memcached instance and cause it to lose that data. So let's see what we've got going here. We've got three instances, one, two, and three, plus memcached running locally. We had some Python interfaces going on here. Let's control D to kill these instances and clean matters up. And we can just pick one of these servers on which to start our operations. So say Ubu serve one, this is the window that we're on. And let's say we want to load some data in. So let's load the contents of products, Linux CBT, let's go with PHP, this is a long syllabus, into memcache D. And this will put it into the cache for us momentarily. So we need to get this file. Now two ways, we can either pull the file directly or pull it from the website and dump it in this one long string. Let's SFTP into Linux CBT build 2. And then from there, momentarily, we'll try to pull that file in. Let's see if it's able to resolve it. And the server could be busy. Let's kill it and try by IP. Maybe it's name resolution base. Let's try. And it comes back. So it's a name resolution issue. But the server is also busy. We have it running a mirror operation with rsync, so that's taking up some of the cycles available. Let's navigate into our directory here, and perhaps into includes, where we'll get our file products, Linux cbt.php as a sample for loading, and let's drop this. So now we've got a file that is roughly 42,000 bytes. Now that's within the one megabyte sphere or realm of values that memcache d or db will support and in examining the contents of this file we see that it's largely html all of our includes for that matter include html no php the php logic takes place outside of the html so we need not worry about the way in which the contents of the syllabi are interpreted by php so to load this into the memcache d we could use mem ccp for example and indicate a given server maybe local hosts because it's one value one key so it'll be stored on only one of the three specified so we can start with local hosts and indicate the name of the file so this will create a key on the server and then a mem ccat of course servers local hosts in search of the key should fail or should return and then when we break it it'll fail so there's the key it's in the memory and any script that pulls this will come back quickly to confirm as such in fact we have a script on the server that will pull on our remote system that'll pull as well that we could use but this is good for our intents and purposes so now of course if we break the server by stopping it or restarting it for example we lose this particular key so let's sudo invoke memcache D restart and then try to pull that value momentarily in again to see how it behaves and you'll see that the value is gone so without loading it it's gone so that's the whole idea with memcache D that will lose your values across restarts or service outages either planned or otherwise whereas with memcache DB it won't so how do we mimic this with memcache DB well first let's get it going let's install it so we'll aptitude search it let's sudo aptitude search memcache where we'll see a number of items various libraries return memcache db is immediately following memcache d so let's install this and momentarily we'll have this available to us now let's just look at the lay of the land quickly we'll depackage once this is completed and it has memcache 
DB, where we'll see some of its traces. So the Berkeley structure is stored beneath varlib memcache db. So install memcache db and this is the container for Berkeley db. And there's a default db. So let's take a quick look at this path called default. Your key values will be stored here and automatically be managed by memcache db and berkeley db and it has a transaction log that's associated with it and so on and if you do a file against these items file star against that directory you'll see that these items or this item is a berkeley db and this is a transaction log we don't have the permissions as if we pseudo it for example It'll give us some more data so berkeley transaction log berkeley database and then data files so that's where you expect to find your key value pairs but we access it through a front end of memcache D that is. And as far as a config file, in etc, just have a look at memcachedb.conf, the counterpart to memcached.conf, so primary config. And you'll see that this file, let's less it, is eerily similar to memcached because again it's built on top of it. So it has the options, allocation of memory, the port 21201 the fact that it binds to local hosts and so on. So this can be commented out, you can load values from other places, etc. But for now, let's just keep our tests local. So with that said, now we should load some information into this particular entry. So we have our file memcache, or the products with XCBT file that's to be loaded into memcache. So let's try to use our tool to do so. Now if you use memccat, for example, this particular utility binds by default to or connects by default to 11211 which is used by memcache d so it won't work by default but we could use a script that currently writes to memcache d and modify it to connect to the appropriate port so that's another way to tackle the problem let's take a look at our directory here actually we'll look at it from the local but if we do it from a local perspective then we'll have to open the port up so in this directory let's see what we've got so we've got test memcache PHP, that's PHP, MySQL. And if we wanted, let's say, just a regular PHP instance that would perform the rights, or even Python, either or would do for us Python as well. So we've got get session ID, that's Python, that doesn't do any inserts, that's just gets. And then we've got, that's cat test memcache temp, so on and so forth. So this one checks the cache for a particular key, and then it searches database so this is SQL oriented so let's find something on our remote system that might be more useful and then perhaps we'll bring it to this system so let's navigate into temp and this has a lot of entries let's remove our ref product star that'll clean that up momentarily and then we'll SFTP into the remote system to pull the script that we've already written and we'll have a quick look at it so Let's pull this instance up. And we should be able to navigate. Into temp memcached, in which we'll have a few scripts that are of use to us. So here we have a script test memcachedb.php that we've already set up so let's get this file and have a brief look so in examining the contents we'll use nano or we actually will use gedit since the GUI is available so let's do an open from here and navigate into temp it's going to be let's check our path that's just home directory temp so actually that's on the remote side so we can't so we have to use nano it's on the wrong server so let's nano test and it's colorized so this is good so what does this do this connects the local host 21201 in search of this particular key. And if it doesn't exist, then it attempts to copy it from this path. So what we'll do is we'll change this path to be relative to our current directory where we in which we have the existing file. And then it sets it with defaults of no flags and 120 seconds, which is ignored by memcache db. So in this way we can programmatically hit the right port. So let's take a look, make sure we have the file here. 
Let's move one level back products to this directory so I can find it. So now currently memcacheDB has no results. In fact, in a separate window, if we, let's tell that to it, but let's set it to bind first to the full socket to the routable IP addresses. So let's sudo nano etc memcachedb.conf and we'll ensure that this is commented out and then restart it. So we'll sudo invoke memcachedb restart and that'll get it going. And then we'll just netstat ntl ensure that it's bound and there it is, 21201. So if we now tell net to Linux CBT Ubu serve 1, 21201, we should be on the port. And then we could try to get the key, which is this file name, which is currently unset. Let's try it. So it comes back with nothing. And you can also execute stats, see what's happening with the memory stats dbd for example to see what's happening with berkeley or bdb that is so stats gives us the berkeley database statistics its memory its cache size etc so now to set the value we'll just run this particular script and that's going to be php test and memcache not found so on this system it didn't find memcache for php let's do a pseudo aptitude search memcache we've been working with the other system as a php client on the ubu desk system so let's sudo aptitude install this and that should get us going momentarily and we'll try it again you should be able to find the library at this stage so the first time it runs it reads the contents of the file and that means there's a cache miss whether you're using memcache db or memcache D and because it's missed it has to pull the contents in from the file but the second time we do so it does so very quickly although we're not timing it there and it's from the cache now how do we know it's from the cache well let's try to get it again and that's the wrong instance in memory it's going to be products on xcbt php let's just pull this out and this should momentarily bring that item in and there you see it it's in its binary form but nonetheless still returns a value now from any remote system if we use for example the same script it'll connect but we'd have to retrofit it to connect to the appropriate IP address so let's nano test we'd want it to connect instead of the local host perhaps to the distinct IP address which is what we suggested earlier should be used in lieu of local host it's always tempting to use local host because it's where we do a lot of our testing. So if we rerun this now, and let's pipe the output into less, it doesn't show no key at the top. And the script, if you take a look at it from the contents, if there's a miss, it echoes no key. We can always delete the key from the server using the appropriate command. Let's go ahead and try it again. And it must have been an extra character at the end of it. And now this will generate a miss. It should read no key. So no key. So this was directly read from the file, then dumped to standard out. But then the second time it runs, then it's from the cache. It's coming from the cache. Now, insofar as this persistent stuff, we're not going to look at replication, the other features, transactions, etc. That's more perhaps a separate four-hour segment on just memcached. But insofar as persistence, the whole idea is if you whack the server invariably or perhaps variably then your values are still available so let's sudo invoke memcache db restart or perhaps you will even stop it initially give it a few seconds so that kills the telnet session back here and of course subsequent will not connect because the sockets no longer available but the data still exists so if we restart the server and then reconnect, we should see that it's available momentarily. And this is the whole idea. And let's try it again with a get, and there's the data. So it persists across the board, and you can pull it from any side. So if we pull it here, sending to last notice, it's a hit. But 
Keep in mind that MemcacheDB still depends on an underlying file, so there is some overhead, but it also takes advantage of memory. So you have a stack of MemcacheD as well as the Berkeley DBM engine to ensure persistence across the board. So once it's up and running and in memory using, let's say, the 64 megs or whatever else has been provisioned, then it's extremely fast and will outperform your DBMS pretty much any day for any key value pair gets that are within the constraints that are defined. So now any script can be retrofitted that we've written to access this new port and it'll work with no problems whatsoever. Just modify them point them to the new port. And then optionally also you can have a memcache DB run on the standard port so that you don't have to retrofit your scripts. So note, if feasible, have memcache DB bind to TCP 11211 so that you need not update your existing scripts. So that's a possibility as well. So certainly, if we were to sudo nano etc memcachedb.conf and change this by commenting it to your typical 11211, then stop using sudo invoke memcached so that releases the resource. So nets that NTL should reveal that 11211 no longer exists. And then let's restart memcacheDB. So let's find a pseudo invoke. And then re-nets that momentarily. So the port is really immaterial. So 11211. So now insofar as the value, well, we've lost our telnet session back here. So let's reconnect this time to 11211. We should easily be able to get our value and it's still indeed there. Then of course, a memc cat servers, perhaps our local IP or local host 75110 for the value should return. It's binary formatted. PHP understands it, however. So certainly if we run our PHP script and send it to less, that'll dump the results accordingly. Let's take a look. Now it's actually looking to connect to 21201, so of course the script needs to be updated accordingly. So, and an ad server could help in that regard. So let's nano test memcacheDB. Temporarily comment this because we may keep both instances going. So 11211, try the script again, and it's a database miss or file miss, file system miss, which means it's a cache hit as opposed. And any utility that has access to standard memcache 11211 will be able to pull your values in accordingly. So that means, of course, if you go to another host and run the same script, it'll work. So long as you have the memcache library. Again, the hashing that's used depends on the library. You've got a very various algorithms. CRC32 is one that comes to mind. And the algorithms will be determined by the client, the live memcache or otherwise client with memcache support. So you may find some variances. You might find that some clients store in binary versus ASCII, etc. Some compress, others don't. So sometimes you may be looking at compressed data, etc. The whole idea with memcache, just to reiterate, is that you can allocate resources by aggregating those free resources into a collective pool and then storing key value pairs in there. Key value pairs pretty much drive the bulk of what you see online and offline for applications. You get a key, it has a value. Key, value, key, value. So if you can spread those key values across your systems, however distributed, here it's all interconnected on the same LAN, but it could be across the net so long as the interconnectivity is fast. You can also designate certain key value pairs to certain servers to improve performance, but it's a superior way to reference data that drive important parts of your website that need not the overhead of a DBMS. So have a look at memcached, memcached DB, they're important facilities.